EPL week again, as it will be for the next 67 weeks as we wrap up the end of the tournament. There's not a lot of rain in India. There is in Auckland, which is why you see us online today. We thought the table was cramped last week. This week, another story. We've got incredible finishes. Good week for the English players. CSK Sri Lankan duo. New Zealand win a game. And Lippy's going to get Rickerton into the conversation yet again. All coming up on the Top Order podcast. Stay tuned. Well, boys, we start the week every week pretty much with the IPL. It is the biggest show in town at the moment. No offence to the New Zealand-Pakistan series, Lippy, which we will come on to a little bit later in the podcast in celebration for those in, um, in black. But let's start with the IPL. We talk about the table each week. It was pretty cramped. I think probably the biggest change this week is Gujarat Titans just go on and on and have established a bit of a lead at the top of the table now. 16 points, Chennai second with 13. And then it really is bunched up with just uh, three points really covering the rest of the table from the Super Giants, the Look Now Super Giants, all the way down to the Delhi Capitals, who this time last week we were saying are out of it. The time before that, the week before we were saying are out of it. But, you know, there's a glimmer of hope. Almost they're the form side, four wins out of five games, uh, which we, we wouldn't have thought we'd have been saying last week. But what do we want to talk about in terms of this week's IPL, first and foremost, Baldy? I, I think we've got to give you some shit about the table for a start. Yeah, you probably do, uh, to be fair. Uh, betting uh, agencies pay attention to what I say on the Top Order podcast. Uh, two weeks ago when we were asked at the halfway point whether I, th- I thought uh, Gujarat would play in the finals, I said no, they've won four out of five. <laughs> Uh, I did say Rajasthan would play in the final. They've lost four out of five. And I wrote Delhi Capitals off as being a a team that uh, had no form and were out of the tournament, and they've won four out of five. So I think what we really need to take away from this is betting agencies need to listen to the Top Order podcast and then take whatever I say, apply the opposite, and then uh, betting agencies will be the winner. Other betting agencies and mechanisms for betting, of course, are available. There we go. My confession for the day early doors, boys. Yeah, look, last week, I, I I think all of us actually kind of said Delhi, Sunrises, and I think Binksy wasn't prepared to, to give up on KKR, but all three of those teams just said, look, hold my beer. And, and that yeah, like you say, the table is just a complete shambles now. And I don't know, it sort of it doesn't even feel like you can call any game an upset anymore. But I, yeah, I honestly think, you know, say what you like about this tournament, and we often sort of mock it for the length of ga- the tournament and the amount of games and and kind of just talk about it in more serious terms about being the exact opposite of what we want cricket to look like in the future. But I think you have to sort of give a lot of credit for the amazing run of games that, that are just happening now. I mean, Binksy mentioned it in the start, the incredible finishes. And it, I, I think that's probably where we should start the podcast. I mean, yeah, I, I want to talk in a bit of detail about that Rajasthan Hyderabad game because that was just absolutely bonkers. <laughs> But I, I haven't seen much from, from last night, New Zealand time. So, Binksy, I think you've watched a fair bit of that KKR versus Punjab game. It's been a, a busy day for me with uh, at work and then, and then uh, getting home with all these floods going on and stuff. So I haven't managed to see any of that. But another last ball finish in that match as well? Yeah, look, absolutely. So, yeah, Knight Riders chasing down 180. Andre Russell was, I think, player of the game or player of the match in terms of the Crick Info and I think the official in-stadium award as well. Jason Roy got the KKR off to a flyer and, and he's been parachuted in and has had a pretty decent start to the tournament, which I suppose that bodes well for him in terms of potential inclusion in that World Cup 50-over squad for, for England. So, mm-hmm. you know, kudos to him for, you know, jumping on a flight and coming out to uh, join the Knight Riders. And then... At, uh, Dre Russ nearly got the KKR, my yeah, my, my boys over the line, um, but mm-hmm. failed really with a with a run out, just a, the the penultimate ball, and it was Rinku Singh who then dispatched uh, yeah, kind of a, a shovely sort of pull shot uh, for four off the final ball to seal that victory, and yeah, look, hit it like a hit it like a ton of bricks, and I, I've got really written down here in terms of you know players throughout the course of the tournament. Rinku Singh really um, is, oh, look, he, he's been really one to watch. Potential for, you know, most impactful player or MVP of the tournament. He's got 337 runs, at an average of 56 and a strike rate, just a tick above 150. So mm-hmm. it really is kind of proving to, yeah, put the icing on the cake for for the KKR. Um, and, and then, yeah, the other, you know, the other game, which was um, that dreadful, you know, siren noise. Um, 
the Royals, the Rajasthan Royals and the Sunrisers. Shit, you wouldn't want to be a bowler in that game, would you? Rajasthan Royals, 214, uh, just a couple of wickets. So Bhuvi Kumar picking up one and Marco Jansen the other. But uh, it was, yeah, you know, if you watch the highlights package, it was like watching the game. It was, um, yeah, it was just a highlights package of a batting innings for uh, for the Royals. And and then Sunrise is making, look, I guess a little bit of a big call. Um, if you look at a guy that they've paid a lot of crawl for in Harry Brook, um, making the decision to bring him out of the firing line. He's got, you know, if we go back a month or so, he's got sort of Surakami Yadav style form. Um, it's sort of binary in terms of the way that he's uh, batting at the moment. So he's removed from the firing line. And look, I'm sure you guys want to talk, or particularly you, Lippy, about Glenn Phillips coming in. Um, uh, yeah, look, when you look at that strike rate, 25 off just seven deliveries, 30, uh, 357 strike rate. But yeah, getting over the, the line off the final ball, um, of the game, um, as it turned out, but the, the previous ball looked, uh, yeah, looked very much like it had um, been sealed by I think Sandip Sharma with a with a dot ball. Um, but no, he's got to re bowl it because the uh, the you know I don't know what it is the DLF maximum sirens gone off or whatever um, in the background and it's a re bowl and uh, yeah different yeah different results to what it looked like um, in the stadium at the, at the at the climax of that game. Yeah, look, I mean. I think we, yeah, let, let's come on to that in a minute. But I, just when you're talking about young players and, and making an impact, someone from that game, Yashvi Jaiswell, I, I honestly, I, I honestly, you watch that guy, I mean, he scored a big hundred earlier in the tournament. This is not a surprise to, to anyone. You know, back back in the days when, when Rajasthan were actually good, he scored a, he scored that hundred. It looked like, you know, him and, him and Butler were just going to be the most unstoppable opening partnership in this tournament. But you watch him hit the ball and you just think, like, international cricket can't be far away for that, this guy. He, he's so, like, so there's just players, right? When I mean, you, you mentioned Harry Brook before. Some players, they hit the ball and you just think, oh, wow. Like, this is something special, the sound that it makes. And I don't know, yeah, I've, I've never been able to hit the ball like that. So I kind of, yeah, no, don't really know what, what that feels like. But, yeah, I mean, he, he just he's just a guy that's, that's got to be very, very close. And, you know, there's there's so many players, even like Sandrew Sampson in that game, this, he's the same. And you think about a guy like him and think, how how has he not become a fixture in this Indian side? And it actually, I think, becomes down to his decision-making that just isn't there when he bats. And, you know, you can go on about the decision-making in this game that he, that, you know, came a lot of questions about what he did as as skipper. Obed McCoy coming in as an impact player, only bowls one over. The 19th is bowled by Kudip, Kuldeep, and he did 41 to win off two overs. And I don't know, like not that long ago, even now, right? That that should be it. 42 That's off it. two overs. You, you, you can't win that game. But you shouldn't win now, that game, and you shouldn't lose it either. You should not lose that game with 41 off two. That That no. is... That is like if you were in a club game and it was a social D league Monday night, everyone gets a bowl because everyone ro ro rolls around in the under tens and you're throwing some, you know, hand grenades in the air or big loopy, loopy admin balls. You, you still shouldn't concede 41 off two overs to concede 41 off two is well, look, it's a credit to the batting team who've, who've done a fantastic job, but really you should be taking care of business as a bowling and fielding side in that situation. You should not be conceding back-to-back -back 20 run overs to, to lose a cricket game, um, regardless of who's at the other end. When that's what... Baldy, Baldy I uh, think... Uh, Lippy, I'm just going to jump in because I think uh, the, there's there's been an evolution of this game. Um, and look, that's clear, right, in terms of the scores that we're seeing. But um, I've got to say that we're seeing more and more of that overs go for t for 20 and bowlers just missing their lengths. And I think we've got to look at the skill of the batting. And look, this is a really, really limited sample size. But you look at someone like Brendan McCullum, who I think we can all agree had a pretty decent T20 career, right? And, and he averaged somewhere in the region of 30 in T20s. A strike rate of, and I'm going to say this, and I'm, I'm taking the piss a little bit, a strike rate of just 130, uh, 136. We've now got, a batting record table in this IPL, where if you look down the top 20 batters, I, I'm not going to count them out, but you've got at least half a dozen players that are averaging over 50 in a tournament that's, you know, 10 or 11 games deep now. 
And pretty much everybody in that list of top 20 batters, with the exception of David Warner, uh, Devon Conway, are striking at above 140. So the, the game has just massively evolved in terms of what batters... Um, batters can do you, know, you look at you know even Glenn Phillips's little cameo the other night so I think sometimes you know as a bowler you, you're, you're not really getting that ability particularly when you're bowling a one over spell at times um, and then you've got to come back and if you just miss your length um, or your line by just a, a small margin then you know 20 is actually you know 20 is a result <laughs> I guess in some of the yeah some of the games that we've I know it's not a result Baldy, but it, <laughs> it, we're seeing it more and more Commonly, yeah, we, are. yeah, we if are. You look but, at the matter scores over two hundred in this tournament already. Yep, yep that's fair. Um, you still shouldn't lose. You still shouldn't lose forty-one off two. Um, but th- th- the fact that batters can do it now and it's not a ridiculous proposition just speaks to how far the game has evolved, even over the last two or three years, right? Um, can we just come back quickly? I've just brought up Rinku Singhs. You talked about Stu players who you were surprised haven't got the call up to international cricket. I've just had a look at Rinku Singhs. Uh, record, his first class record, 40, 30 first class games averages 59 with 700s. Uh, list A games, 50 list A games averages 53 at a strike rate of 95. And T20s average 30 in T20s at a strike rate of 140. And they're magic numbers. They're, they're international standard numbers. You know, India have just so many players. I'm not surprised that they've got heaps and heaps of um, players coming in and out of their national side and they can't find or settle on an 11, because they've got about 50 that they could choose from. Um, and this Rinku Singh, he's only 25. He's he's really starting to come to the fore in this tournament. And it seems like every year they've got a new player. India have a new player in the IPL that stamps their authority on the tournament. Two years ago, it was Samson. Last year, it was Sky. This year, it's Rinku Singh and others, Jaswal included. Yeah. Uh, just, the, just the incredible depth. We need to give him a shout-out, because he's got an international standard record, that guy. And I think from a first class perspective, Bordy, as well, that you know the, the Indian uh, Indian setup. I think there's an argument over how strong that first class cricket is, and we see a lot of guys graduate into this international oh, team sure. th- through T20 cricket. Um, not least, yeah. Ish- Ishan Kishan's just got the call up for the World Test Championship squad in, in uh, replacing KL Rahul. So we're seeing that form in the franchise world translating into them. Uh, off, offering those sort of international plaudits. So, yeah, one, definitely. I don't think you can put him in your little black scouting book board. He's already burst um, on the scene. Oh, he's and, well and truly, well and truly yeah. on the scene. Didn't let, hear it here first, that's for sure. Let, let's bring it back to the New Zealand players because you were just about to give Glenn Phillips a shout-out and, and then you guys went off on a, a very good tangent. I, I, uh, I gave him two shout-outs. I've mentioned his strike rack twice, Lippy. What more do you want? Oh, exactly. I'm, I'm pleased that you went there. Don't don't uh, don't get me wrong, but basically picking up on what you said about all the 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 options that batters have. Phillips in that over, the 19th over, he goes straight six. Then he hits one over over extra cover for six off the next ball. Then he hits a six over mid wicket, and he's out later in the over, and he's got 25 off seven. I think he got man of the match for that 25 off seven, just because it changed. He got it one of the men of the match because, you know, there's about 15 people go up and get it one of those giant novelty checks at the end of the game. And he definitely got one of them. So, you know, he, whatever he did, it was, it was impactful enough to, to be recognized in that way. And he, yeah, you I... know, it means that they ended up needing only 17 off six balls, which like I say, it feels like only these days because, you know, first ball dropped catch, second ball Joe Root hits, you know, almost pulls off a stunner, but it goes for six, and they get down to five to win off that last ball. Like you say, caught off the at mid off, and I was actually watching that game live. I kind of uh, woke up about five o'clock in the morning, couldn't go back to sleep, so I just thought, stuff this, I'll just get up and watch what's going on, and I, you know, I kind of. Saw that catch and went, oh, yeah, cool. Rajasthan have won. Sunrise is another game that they sort of let, you know, my, my preseason pick is, I think they've lost about three or four games now just by under 10 runs. And But, you know, you, like you say, you hear that siren and you just go, oh, no, like, what are you doing? And and I actually think as soon as that ball goes over the sight screen for six, you see those Rajasthan players. And I, I think this is going to be a really hard game for them to get back from mentally because... Like you say, Baldy, they've had four out of five losses at the moment. They were a side that I just thought on paper, they're too good to sort of get in trouble in this tournament. They'll always 
they'll be in the playoffs and and they might well still be there but you don't you you lose a game like that and I I think it actually has an impact and they're going to have to I think if they don't win their next game I think they could go on a big slide because it's it's really tough to bounce back when you had the two points in your hand and now you've lost them yeah look it's it's fantastic and uh, you mentioned it earlier on lip and talked about it. we criticized the format I, th- I think the reality is that we know that this is a format that's going to exist for a period of time we know that the ipl is going to be pivotal in terms of the way that cricket develops i've got to admit i've, I've not massively been on the bandwagon previously but it, it is that sense of occasion and i think it is now that you're getting the solid window and the development and the emergence of all of these players that's making it such a fantastic yeah fantastic spectacle and um, and Bordy, I think to come back to your point around that sort of 20, you know, being, you know, not great and going for 40 off two overs not being great. I think what we've also, also got to think about is it's almost going so money ball in terms of the tactics and the matchups and the analysis now that I think each over is almost an at bat. It, it, you know, it's, it's an event in itself. Um, which can swing that momentum of the game. And, you know, that's why I think, you know, to an extent they take so long to bowl each um, each innings and each over because they, they want to get that plan right because one delivery can make such a big, you know, a big difference in um, in this game now that they put so much into the analysis of it. And let's do some analysis on Virat Kohli. Um, got in the Slack channel again that he's on the go slow. So striking, I think we mentioned earlier on, somewhere around about, um, a hundred and a hundred and thirty or thereabouts. And um, are, are we are we really going to criticise probably one of the, the the world's greatest players again and and it, incur the wrath of our Indian listeners and followers? Lippy, you you want to chime in? I think on on the great Virat. Oh look, I actually just wanted to pick up on what you said before about the you know that every over is a is an event, I guess, in T Twenty cricket, and I think that's. That's why players, I'm starting to come around to that way of thinking because originally we, we've had the same sort of discussion with KL Rahul, right? And we were all talking about it. And I was, I've always been a defender of his and looked at his, you know, total runs. And even actually, I think you can see it now that LSG is struggling a bit without him. And I, I, I do still stand by that. But actually, when you look at uh, what Virat did in that game, where I think we're talking about the Delhi game where, you know, he batted most of the way through that innings, ended up like say of fifty odd off forty odd balls, which in for you know, that's a reasonable score. It's not like he's done something terrible out here and wasted twenty deliveries. But I think a lot of people look at it and go, each one of those deliveries is an opportunity to score. And if you're kind of going through the back half of the innings and you're only getting ones or you're you're not really accelerating, you do get criticized these days. And you actually just, you look at the scores all around this IPL, I mentioned the games before where it's 200 plus, V200 plus, you actually just have to go that hard now. And you have to back your team to be able to, you know, if you get out, you have to back the players behind you to come in and get it. So I, I don't, you know, I think chill, we we can all chill out that Virat Kohli's not a bad player. He's I think like before last night's game, he was fifth on the run charts. He's got six fifties from ten games. I mean, he's he's doing very well in this tournament, and he's you know in the last I think in the last six to twelve months, kind of recaptured some of that form that we thought he might have lost, particularly in the the white ball formats. It's all going very well for Virat, but yeah, I I do think that some of that criticism is fair that we you know. That those guys do have to take into account, and they have to they have to know what's a good score. I think you can bat as quickly or as slowly as you want to, but if you get that score wrong, then your account you have to be held accountable. And look, I think the difference for the RCB when you contrast that with someone like Delhi Caps is you've got Faf de Plessis at the top of the run charts and striking above 150. So there's almost that, you know, th- those guys can play off each other and you're not always going to strike at 150, 160, 170. The issue for Delhi is Warner's had to kind of carry the side on his on his own back and play both a sort of anchor role and a aggressor role because, you know, the next person on the run charts, you have to go a long, long way down until you find Axa Patel. Um, who's, again, himself only striking at just over 130. So he's not getting a lot of backup and a lot of support from the rest of that Delhi Caps um, top order. 
Um, but yeah, certainly I think if, you know, they don't make the, the final four, the dominator and the pizzanator or whatever it's called at the end, um, there'll be some questions, obviously, particularly given um, from a run scoring perspective, they're going to certainly have a couple of guys that are in that top 10, uh, top 10 on the run charts. Before we leave the IPL, anywhere else we want to go? Well, Lippy, I know you're probably itching to talk about um, a New Zealand white ball victory. Well, I am. You can't, yeah, can't, can't get past that. But I, I do think we should spend a little bit of time on on Gujarat. I and sort of, I mean, you mentioned them before about how good they're going. Um, I wouldn't mind talking a little bit about some of these English players as well. But Gujarat, I think it's been a really nice week for you, for you, and uh, and all the players that you support. Ridiman Saha scoring scoring big runs. Couldn't couldn't get his trousers on the right way when he went off the field and, and came back on. That was a bit of an error, but. Seem to seem to uh, not affect them too much. Amazing sort of start for them. Shubman Gill and Saha had seventy eight, I think, after the power play. Hundred was up after eight, just over, just a tick over eight overs. Hundred and forty two run opening stand and twelve overs. I mean, that they're, they're just. You said it before. They just look like the winning side, and and they, I don't see how they they stopped at the moment because. You look at their team that Saha and Gil we just named. There's Hardik Pandya, uh, David Miller, and then their bowlers as well. Like they're just so well balanced with Shami and you know the two Afghani spinners who I'm I'm loving watching. You know everyone knows about Rashid Khan has known about him for a long time, but the the emergence of Noor Ahmad and and I think the the confidence that a lot a lot of spinners are actually getting even see. Um, Chakrabarti for K- KKR bowling really really important overs at the death and yeah it's just been fantastic to watch and I just I just think Gujarat they, they just look like the most balanced side and and I, I they're just doing the business and I don't really quite see how anyone challenges them at the moment because everyone else is so up and down. Yeah, look, I think I couldn't agree more with what you've said. The thing for me with that side is whilst there's some guys that are clearly what you describe as marquee players, superstars, you know, Hardik Pandya. Um, we talked a little bit about Shubman Gill. They're, they're relatively unassuming, the majority of them, in the way that they do that. You know, Mohammed Shami um, is at the top, I think, of the wicket charts now. Rashid Khan has just, you know, gone on a little bit of a roll, and I think he's second. Um, and whilst he's an absolute rock star, th- there's a level of sort of, you know, there's a level of sort of some of their parts being greater than the individual contributors in that team. You know, there's no one that's going to be, you know, the person that's wanting to get paparazzi as they go into the nightclub um, after the, you know, after the game. And that seems to be, you know, holding them in really good stead. And David Miller, I've got to admit, is, yeah, there's an argument that he's one of the best finishers in the game at the moment. Uh, you know, when he comes in, doesn't always look super pretty, uh, but man, he, he hits a, yeah, he hits a meaty cricket ball. Um, Lip, you want to talk about the England players briefly? I'm I'm always happy to do so. But yeah, your your thoughts? Well, uh, yeah, I kind of just want to get your thoughts because it's been um, we talked about the Aussie players last week, and uh, you know I'm not shy in uh, introducing the New Zealand players whenever I can. But I don't think we've we've had much conversation about these English players. Josh Butler's obviously burst back into form with his 90 odd the other day. Phil Salt getting a chance for Delhi. And, and I think uh, you mentioned, I think that was one of your big calls early doors that uh, in the preview that, that Phil Salt could actually come in and, you know, uh, Delhi wouldn't necessarily lose a lot with, uh, with the absence of, of Richard Punt. And we hadn't seen much of him, but there we go. He comes in, plays a match winning innings. Liam Livingston starting to hit some form. Moeen Ali's been nice for CSK, but then on the flip side, you have Mark Wood, who's gone home early for the birth of his child. You know, a, I mentioned before about Kale Rahul, you know, not being there for, for LSG and that being a big blow. I mean, no Mark Wood, I think, is equally or if not more of a blow for, for that side. But then also Jofra Archer, you know, it, it just continues for him. His in, injury struggles. He's now gone. He's now officially left the IPL. And uh, I think Chris Jordan's come in to replace him yeah. for, for Mumbai. I think that's been announced today. But But what are you seeing from from Joffre in terms of like there's been a bit about you know his role in the ashes and there's there's been a lot of that conversation but I can't see how he plays any role in the ashes and even I mean I think there's got to be question marks about his uh his availability or his um his availability to at least 
contribute on a, on a significant level in this World Cup that's coming up. I, you know, he's just had such a tough time and he can't seem to get back into it. Yeah, look, I'll come full circle and, and answer the Jofra Archer question at the end. I think uh, Phil Salt, I said it at the top of the, the previous show, I think, um, he has got some pretty decent numbers. If he'd been in the side, he'd be somewhere around, uh, yeah, he'd certainly be in the sort of top, uh, yeah, top 10 or 15 run scorers if he'd have carried on at the same rate that he's he, he's got in his five innings so far. Strike rate up at 177, and he's had a couple of really influential um, game-changing innings in, in the tournament for, for Delhi Caps, who've been struggling. And conversely, Harry Brook has, has, you know, has really struggled 100, but only 63 runs across the rest of those eight knocks, which tells me that's close to an average of eight if you take that 100 out. Um, it's not really an average then, but I know Baldy likes to manipulate <laughs> statistics a little bit. Um, and then, look, as you said, I think Livingston yeah, coming good um, for the Punjab um, team as well. So, I th- yeah, look, decent for the England guys. I always think Mark Wood was going to go home. The birth of his child can't have been a massive surprise. Um, okay. So I think from a planning perspective, um, <laughs> yeah, I think that that was always, you know, always going to be there. And look, really, really interesting to see how quickly... Jason Roy came in for the KKR. So you, you've almost got to think that they've got that lined up as if so-and-so is injured, this is the person that we've booked an airline ticket for. And look, I think Chris Jordan ar- arrived at the airport um, into the arrivals lounge before Joffre had got through security in the departures lounge. So again, they've, they've kind of got that piece uh, piece lined up. He said, I think that he'd you know, be happy to play in one of those five test matches. I, I think that that's a little bit of a stretch. And Um, If we then kind of flip that to the county scene that's going on at the moment, Jimmy Anderson uh, uh, back to his miserly best three for 35 um, in the second innings of the game against um, Nottinghamshire, actually, for Lancashire. So Stuart Broad, the night hawk, um, blocked the stink out of it for 50 balls to deny Lancashire and and Jimmy Anderson a a win. Um, And then Ollie Robinson as well in the wickets, taking 14 wickets, um, playing at the same county as Steve Smith, um, who I think came out to bat in a non-regulation helmet without the little stem guards on, so got sent uh, sent back to recommence his innings. So I think from a bowling perspective, your mate Ollie Stone as well, um, Lip is you know is fit and, and firing um, as well for Nottinghamshire. So I, I I don't know that the loss of Jofra Archer is going to be that huge if Mark Wood is fit and if Ollie Stone is fit and if we've got the likes of uh, Robinson, Broad, Anderson, and then probably Chris Wokes, who has a fantastic record in English cricket um, in England with a Duke's cricket ball. I, I just wonder whether they'll even need to take a risk on 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 Jofra Archer, unless it goes into the oval on a really flat deck at the end of the summer, and they they want to go all guns blazing with a little bit of uh, a little bit of firepower. Yeah, look, it's just sad, isn't it? I I just. I want to see him back playing and, and it just isn't happening for him. And it's, you know, more, more elbow troubles. And yeah, like these, I mean, we've seen it with Kane's elbow that it, it took a long time to, uh, it's, it's something that you use a lot when you're playing cricket, right? And I don't see how you kind of, uh, how it gets right without not playing. So, or, or, you know, taking, yeah, taking an extended break and then a whole bunch of managing throughout your career. So yeah, I just want to see him backfiring, and it's it's sad to that it just isn't happening for him right now. Well, let's go from a sad note to a, a happy note. We talked last week. I just want to get your view, Lippy. Bl- Tom Blundell coming into the side and picking up the gauntlet straight away with uh, Latham moving to the middle order in that uh, in that ODI side, but a victory in the fifth and final game of that uh, series. I don't want to take the gloss off it, but I, I watched quite a bit of the game, Stu, and it, it looked like an old-fashioned one day. I know you've got the win and, and kind of put a really, really good score upon the board, but it you know, it, it just felt for me it was a, there was a little bit of a lack of firepower. And when Adam Milne came out to bat at number eight, I thought that, you know, a couple of guys might have been caught in the toilet or something, because um that's probably at least two or three too high for, for Adam Milne in international cricket, you'd have to say. But a win nonetheless, and yeah, some promising signs from um you know your will young stock continues to go up yeah it doesn't it, it doesn't look i mean yeah look at this has been an interesting series and and i think there are there are quite a few questions that that come out of it i mean you know it's 
it's one of those weird series that's sort of on late at night for us here in New Zealand that that particularly for me, the timing would get to about 10 o'clock and I'd think, oh, maybe I'll just watch the first few overs and then, you know, inevitably my wife would come walk into the living room at midnight sort of saying, is everything okay? Which, you know, a few people, even the two of you listening might be thinking uh, that that is a conversation for, for maybe for a different podcast, but this is a cricket podcast and I'm I'm sure I'm I'm uh, surrounded by by friends and, and listeners who share the same feeling. So, you know, when I answer something like, uh, you know, oh yeah, no, I'm not far away. I just want to see if Will Young gets his hundred, and then watch for another thirty minutes before I'm actually falling asleep on the couch. It, you know, I think people can kind of understand that. But like, in terms of the cricket, I, I think it is really good that we won the game because we've had we've played some really decent cricket on this tour and i think we probably deserved at least the one win if you if you run through those scores i mean you know you mentioned it there we've we've had milne and shipley and things batting batting at eight which you know i think on these flat decks probably you don't you don't you would back your seven batters six or seven batters to to do the business and and not really have to worry about those players down in the lower order but you know, New Zealand scored 288 in the first game, lost with nine balls to go. Scored 336 in the second game, lost with 10 balls to go. Scored 261 uh, in the third game, lost by 26 runs. Took a bit of a hammering in that fourth game, only scored 230, chasing about 330. And then in this last game, they've scored 299 and, and won by 47 runs. So I think if you'd have said at the start of the, the series, these are the five scores we'll put on the board, I think you probably think we're going to score going to win more than one game and and that actually probably uh credit it's credit to Pakistan the way that they've batted Bakar Zaman and, and Baba and you know Iftikhar in this last game they've got a lot of firepower in that side and and you know credit credit to them for what they've done and and also I think it shows a little bit of that there's there's not quite the depth there in the seam bowling that we you know we might hope for in, in New Zealand I know that uh this is something we'd, we'd have talked about previously, and actually, when you look through this side, there there are not many players in that uh, seam bowling attack that I think are necessarily close to uh, being in consideration for the World Cup. You know, the likes of Shipley, the likes of Bo- uh, Lister, the likes of Tickner, who played some games. Shipley had had his moments, but I don't think any of those guys are really in serious uh, questions for for this World Cup. So, you know, I think that's. Those are the the weaknesses, but I still think there are there are a lot of good things that come, have come out of this tour, and there are still but there are still quite a few questions that we we have to answer. I, I think some players have. I, I think the, to answer your question more broadly, I think actually New Zealand has a has a question to answer about the balance of their side. They they need to really decide: Are we going with five specialists with our bowlers, or are we going to try and patch together that fifth bowling option with Nisham and Bracewell and Mitchell and and you know whoever else you want to add maybe Phillips can bowl a few overs and kind of get you through certainly in, in Indian conditions maybe you can sneak two or three overs out of him in every game because I think that actually they can't pick I don't think they can pick their fifteen until they decide which balance they would most prefer because when I look through those that lineup the question of you know, do we take Jimmy Neesham or Mark Chapman, for example? I think it comes down to what kind of a balance of our side we want because the six, seven, eight is really fascinating to me because there are, you know, I think Mitchell's obviously put his hand up to come and bat three and you end up going, okay, well, if he's going up the order, Phillips maybe, you know, that means Latham probably bats four, Phillips bats five. Who's who's at six? Is it a specialist batter in the, in the likes of Mark Chapman or do you bring a specialist batter in like Will Young and pick him at three and push everyone back down again? Or do you go, okay, six is going to be Jimmy Neesham, seven's going to be Michael Bracewell, eight's going to be Mitchell Santner, and then you've got three more bowlers. And then you're kind of going, okay, well, or can we pick the side and go, okay, we'll have our better batter at six, and then we'll have seven being Mitchell Santner, which, like Binksy said, maybe is half a spot too high. And then you've got eight, nine, 10, and 11 will be a Milne or a Ferguson or a Southey or a Henry or, uh, you know, Trent Bolt's not going to get that high, unfortunately, for him. But, you know, you know what I mean. Sodi, there are, there are a bunch of guys that probably are nines and tens that would end up batting eight. And I think if they can't 
I don't know that they've answered that question really because Nisham hasn't particularly performed in this ga- this series. He's been out with injury most of the games. I think he's only batted twice in, in this or played two two games in the series. Only scored twenty eight runs in the series. Again, didn't or only bowled I think eleven overs or something. Only two games. You know what can you take of that? There are guys like him and and Lockie Ferguson I think that are going to be relying and even Finn Allen, but I think he's he's a sort of a different question that are going to be relying a lot on how much do we trust your your previous performances? Because I think the one person on the bowling side that has put their hand up, aside from Matt Henry, who I think was a complete lock for the starting lineup, is outside of Trent Bolt, our number one, uh, you know, international white ball or certainly ODI bowler in my in my mind. I think Adam Milne has really pressed his claim for for at least the conversation should it be Milne or Ferguson? Because yeah. Lockie hasn't been great in the last six months. And Adam Milne did a really nice job on really tough pitches over here in Pakistan. I think he went, I think he, you know, average, had the best average in the series, about 30, you know, average 30 in the series, which, like I said, in a run fest, that's a really good effort. His economy rate was about five and a half, I think, which again, pretty good effort when you're bowling the death overs and the and the opening overs. Yeah, I, I think he's probably the one out of the bowling side that I, I'm starting to think I've got a bit of faith in you and, and I think that it wouldn't be ridiculous to pick him over Ferguson in the squad. And Nippy, I think just to come in on the batting piece, I think if this was a T twenty tournament, then I think you probably could shunt people up half a position and, and be successful with that. I, I really think that Chapman's probably in the conversation now. Um because I think particularly in a you know a, um, a World Cup where spin is potentially going to play a part, those middle overs are important, probably more so than being able to launch the ball out of the ground in the, in the last five overs. It's going to be that, that middle period that I think is important for the way that your side sets up a little bit. So I, I think that they will go with that batting, you know, that batting option. And and I also just want to say I was really impressed with Shipley actually, uh, particularly yesterday. Um, mm. If I look at you know two of the three wickets that he got were real hard length, and the LB of Rizwan, and then he got the guy caught on the ring, uh, just hit on the stickers. It was a little bit you know quicker, a, a heavy ball as they used to say, or probably still do. So look, I was really impressed with with him, and I think again what that what that looks like a little bit like your Adam Milne, Lockie Ferguson conversation is Shipley's probably the replacement, you know, in terms of style to a Henry, isn't he? So you, you've kind of starting to build that bench strength of um, probably with the exception of another left armor um, because, you know, I, I don't think you're going to go down the route of uh, the lad that played for Auckland who came in, whose name escapes me for a second as, as a bolt replacement. But I, I think you've got a lot of those other bases covered throughout the throughout the depth of your your squad with you know a few guys to come in from the IPL, right? I think the, your, your point about Shipley is is fair and, and and good and worth mentioning because I you know in that last game he got up to 140 clicks as well and yeah I mean look I I said that he I don't think he's close to to the World Cup squad it doesn't mean there weren't good signs from him and, I, and I, like you say I, I think it's it bodes well for for the future because I think that. There's a fairly good chance, you know, again, at least in my head, that this might be Trent Bolt's last sort of tournament for us on a, an international level. We need we need this this depth. Uh, you know, Southie's, Southie's still around the World Cup squad or this white ball squad. I think he'll still be in our World Cup squad. And, and you know, but he's sort of at the point where I, I don't know that he's, in the top three seamers, if we're if we're including those in the side in terms of balance, and because Matt Henry's passed him, and at least in the in the hierarchy and, and all of that stuff, so yes, I think it's it's really valid in terms of uh, what you know Shipley's Shipley's positive signs because when he first went over to India, he looked, uh, I think he looked sort of military medium, and India dealt with him very easily on very flat wickets. Yeah. incredibly tough place to make your debut on on those wickets. He came back here to New Zealand and showed a lot of good signs. Took took five for against uh, Sri Lanka. You know, actually bowled well in New Zealand conditions. And now he's gone over to Pakistan and and we're seeing an improved performance overseas from him. So I think hopefully he's learning a lot from these experiences 
and we're going to get a lot from him going forward. Another question I have really that I, I'm interested to kind of get your perspectives on your own, uh, you know, the teams that you support in England and Australia and the balance that you expect them to go with is the wicket keeping because I, I, you mentioned Chapman before. If we're purely going on batting and what they, uh, their value to this ODI side, I think I would certainly pick Chapman over Blundell. Just, you know, I love what Blundell's done in the test game. I just don't think he's had, he hasn't just had really had the opportunities in the white ball game for New Zealand. And I don't think he did enough in this series. He, I think he averaged about 30 odd, had a really good chance to kick on and, and got him when he got his 60 odd and then kind of ran himself out. It was a good piece of fielding, but, you know, probably didn't need to, to, to take that second in that situation. But the question really is, are New Zealand happy enough with Devin Conway as their backup keeper? Because if they're not, then Blundell has to be in that 15. And then he then it means that he's filling a role that maybe a Will Young fills or maybe a Mark Chapman fills and or maybe even a Jimmy Neesham fills because I, I do think there are you know, three or four of those guys that are fighting for, for only a couple of spots. So, I mean, if you think about, I don't know, Baldy, the Australian squad, is there going to be a, a backup keeper? I think England, maybe it's a bit easier for them because there's, well, well I'm in my head at least, there's, there's Butler and Besto both possibly in the mix for those kind of roles. I, I sort of have lost track, completely lost track of, of who is in the England England white ball setup because they, they're, they're off at, uh, you know, bilateral series all the time and, and different players are playing in those squads. Yeah, and and lit for, for England, I th- look, I don't think they're going to have a, a problem because I think Butler and Besto will both be in that 15-man squad if they're, if they're both fit. I'd expect, obviously, Butler to continue to take the gloves and then you've got uh, Phil Salt on the periphery as well. So uh, they're not going to have a problem, I don't think, with having that quality option. Um, and either of those, um, can you have either when you name three people? I don't know. Anyway, um, any of those three could take the gloves um, in, a, in an international one day game. I, I'd imagine as well that if the tournament's the same rules and the same format as normal, it's not quite like the T20 World Cup where the, the games are a little bit more condensed. So I think if you do get an injury to Tom Latham and did want to call up Blundell, presuming that Latham's injured for the whole tournament and they can make that call to replace him, then, you know, Blundell's probably got, yeah, I suppose a little bit of a brief, mate, don't go and hit the, you know, don't go and hit the holiday buffet too hard. And we, you know, keep yourself in decent shape and and make sure your passport's close by at all times. And he might come in as a, a replacement if they, you know, they do need to do that for injury throughout the course of the tournament as well. Yeah, I think it's fascinating, with like the balance. Yeah, I do. I mean, probably nine or nine. I think nine of the names are, are certainly penciled in into a, a starting lineup, and then New Zealand have a few questions. And you know, I've, I mean, even looking back to the last uh, World Cup squad for for New Zealand for the ODIs, Blunder was in that squad. Didn't play a game, but I, I think they might. You know. I think they might take him, and if if they do, it means yeah, it means Chapman or Anisham or a Young are, are going to miss out. And you know, you said that the the Will Young stock has has gone up, and I'm very quick to praise him usually. And and he's look look, he has looked the goods in the series. I I think he'd be pretty disappointed that he hasn't absolutely cashed in and and nailed that spot down. I know he scored two eighties. He he loves an eighty. He, he just cannot get his uh, he he cannot go on and um you know, really make a, a significant hundred for New Zealand in, in those um, in those games that count. But, you know, third game, ball watching, got run out once he was set. Fourth ODI, hit one up in the air once he was on about 15, looking good. You know, in his 80 in the, the fifth the ODI, nicked a good one from Shadab. You know, average 48. On paper, it looks really nice, but yeah, I just think he hasn't he hasn't quite done what he needs, and and I think if you're him, you're not going okay, cool, I've booked my ticket. I think you're going all right. I hope I've done enough, and you you're nervously sort of not waiting out these next few months. He's going to have uh, and probably get another opportunity, or or he might not if we decide to go with our best eleven when we play ODIs. I think against England is our next opportunity, but that's right before yeah. the right before the, the World Cup squad is probably going to be selected. I think at that time, they'll probably have 
you know, 14, 15 names in pencil on the, on the sheet already. So, so I think when that squad is announced, it'll be very close to, to the kind of team that we expect to, to go to that World Cup. So, yeah, I think it's he, he probably just hasn't quite done enough in this series to say, I'm there and, and uh, you know, all the faith that you guys have shown in me on the top order is, is, uh, is going to be repaid. Look, absolutely, Lip. I think he can definitely get down to working style to have his tour blazer fitted, but um, they might only pay the deposit and, and, you know, alter the sleeves for someone else at the last minute. And um, Lip, we're going to finish the podcast with you. We, we promised at the top of the podcast um, a Rickerton uh, a Rickerton link. So for anyone that has listened to this 55 minutes, um, they get the bonus of the 56 minute talking about um, Rickerton before we finish the podcast. But uh, over to you, Lip. Oh, look, delighted, delighted to, to mention Rickerton. I think I messaged you on, on Twitter immediately as, as Cole was smashing it all over the place. Look, it's just another another Rickerton record holder for, for New Zealand. Um, yeah, look, I mean, Obviously, on a personal level, it's, it's great to see Cole McConkie get a, you know get another opportunity. You know, I think yeah, as you say, listeners to long time listeners to the podcast will know that uh, I've got a lot of uh, love for for Rickett and Cricket Club, and um, you know was played many years there and, and uh, alongside Cole at, at various times. And yeah, I, I just think a lot of people were quite critical of his selection and, and the, when his when the side came out. I think especially when Chapman started scoring runs in that T Twenty series and. Chapman wasn't in that ODI squad and, you know, everyone was kind of saying, you know, what's what's going on here? We've got Rutchin, we've got all this other stuff. But I think to, to Cole's credit, he, has, he had an excellent Plunkett Shield season and he's actually done the business with Canterbury for, for quite a few years now. And, and that Canterbury side's been very successful, as, uh, as you guys might have mentioned a, a few times on the podcast as well. And I'm just pleased that he got the chance in this series to show that he can handle himself at that level. You know, when you go and play the T20s and stuff that he's had opportunities at before, you bat at seven. We've seen it with Ratchin as well. You, you get very limited opportunities. You you bowl one or two overs. You come in when there's two or three overs to go. You don't really get a chance to to kind of fire and actually show that you can perform. So, you know, to, to score the fastest ODI 50 on debut for New Zealand and and look, he was only on 12 after 19 balls, and then he smashes a six off Shadab, gets him going, hit, hit, went to his 50 with a massive six off Shaheen Shah Afridi. It, they're the kind of things that give you a lot of confidence. And and I think when you're a player like Cole, like some of the other guys that we've mentioned, Shipley, that are on the fringes of these sides that you know maybe are not going to be picked next time an ODI squad gets named, all you want from them is to show that they can perform at this level and, and put their hand up and say, you know, you can, I, I can be here. I'm, I'm good enough to play at this level. And I think he certainly did that. And yes, yeah, just, just very pleased for him. And yeah, I know he's a guy that works very hard on his game and, and um, yeah, delighted to see some, some success for him. Fantastic. Well, as much as it pains me to leave you with a final word, Lip, we, we will end the podcast here. Mumbai Indians about to kick off against the RCB as we record this podcast. Also, an ODI going on at Chelmsford as well with Ireland taking on Bangladesh. So plenty of cricket as well as the IPL around the world at the moment. We will be back next week um, to see the topsy-turvy nature of the Premier League table. No doubt change again. Another round of county championship matches, some ODI cricket from around the world and probably some more musings on potential World Cup squads as we lead into um, the rest of the, the English summer now, uh, which is pretty uh, pretty good. And we're just about a month away from an Ashes Test match as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm sure we'll get onto the subject of that little urn at some point, Michael, um, on the Top Order podcast. But for now, it is good night and good bless from us all here in Auckland. We'll hopefully be back to the full co compliment with Raj in the room. Uh, next week to talk some more IPL. But for now, good night and God bless from us all here. We'll see you soon. Good night.